Morning, good evening, grace, brethren, and sisters. Let's have all of back along with us here with our Temperance Awakening. And look forward to doing our uh, the lecture that we have here uh, today. Going to be looking at advertising and smoking. Uh, just going to do a little bit of a snapshot about this here because we are going to get into this in more detail a uh, a bit later. <clears throat> and uh, But going to uh, uh, give a little bit of a general overview. Uh, here today and look at a lot of the deception and hypocrisy uh, that the uh, tobacco industry has been in. And uh, speaking of all that, we've got another book here that we want to show people. This is the one that we mentioned a, uh, a lecture or a two ago. And uh, this is a bit of a dated book, came out in the late 80s, but is wonderful, though, has a lot of bad information, like things that we're going to be looking at today. Uh, it's called Merchants of Death. It is by Larry C. White. He is a, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, he is a, an attorney who, as far as I know, is still living. He would be an elderly man now, uh, but uh, but he is an attorney, though, that was a smoker uh, that, who quit smoking, and that's actually what he looks at is a lot of, like, the deception and hypocrisy, <clears throat> uh, like in the tobacco industry, how they, uh, you know, advertise their product, knowing that it was something that uh, that was fatal, uh, knowing that it caused, you know, fatal cancers and diseases, etc. The forward is by uh, Dr. C. Everett Koop. Of course, he was the uh, Surgeon General uh, of the uh, of the United States there back like in the uh, late 80s, maybe uh, through the early 90s or so. Uh, for a while, he uh, served. Well, it's a really good book there. So that's about the American tobacco industry and uh, how they uh, covered up and deceived <clears throat> uh, with, uh, with a lot of their product and things. And so that's a wonderful book there. You can get that used as a, at a very inexpensive price on Amazon and eBay. I got that one for just a dollar and something, but then after you, I paid for shipping and handling, uh, that was just like around five dollars. But a wonderful, wonderful read, though, for such an inexpensive cost. And so now getting into, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, getting into uh, what we have here today, looking at advertising and tobacco. And uh, for more than 200 years, advertising, uh, first on signs and then in newspapers and magazines and then later on radio and television, uh, made smoking very popular. Uh, made smoking and tobacco very popular, made those companies rich, got them a lot of money. And uh, the struggle to get ad tobacco advertising off the air is really what launched today's anti-smoking movement, like today, you know, on television, uh, like it on radio stations and all, and, you know, even in like magazines, etc. You see a lot more ads to help people, you know, to quit tobacco. <clears throat> Uh, but it was very controversial, but like very controversial, like what, you know, Larry, Larry White writes about in that book and things there about about to advertise. Of course, now, you know, like a tobacco companies, they are not allowed to advertise anywhere except like in the places where you buy their products. You know, like if you go to gas stations, you know, you see the signs and things that are on the trash cans and all uh, for, you know, tobacco, cigarettes, you know, dip, chewing tobacco, etc. And uh, so the growth of the tobacco advertising and of the uh, tobacco advertising, all the advertising that they've done here. The first recorded tobacco ad appeared in a New York newspaper in 1798 for the products of Lord Brothers. And uh, founded in 1760, the Lord Corporation is still one of the six major tobacco manufacturers. However, they have greatly declined. Uh, they are, like I said, still one of the top six, but that's not nearly as big as like Brown and Williamson and uh, Philip Morris, et cetera, and like R.J. Reynolds. And uh, the company made the transition from uh, creating handmade products to mass producing cigarettes by machine. Just as technology enabled giant growth in the tobacco industry, the development of color printing created an explosion in advertising. Of course, you know, that's something like back in the, you know, the uh, previous century, like in the 20th century. Uh, you know, whenever like color advertising all became very popular and uh, <clears throat> that also, you know, uh, helped tobacco, you know, just like uh, advertising exploded. Tobacco also exploded because they aggressively used, you know, that color advertising. <clears throat> Then in 2001, Advertising Age, the major trade journal covering the advertising business in the U.S., they launched a website that looked back at the 20th century as the advertising century. And the magazine listed the 100 most effective advertising campaigns. 
And, you know, whenever you think about that, you consider all the advertising that's done, like for cars, clothes, uh, you know, soft drinks, restaurants, fast food chains, etc. Uh, you might be a little surprised to know that five of the all-time best ads were actually cigarette ads. Five of them, five out of the hundred. And advertising agencies often create characters portrayed by actors or, you know, even cartoons to serve as a spokesperson or spokespeople or some type of symbol uh, for the product. And Americans, you know, they encounter a vast number of characters in advertisements. Well, that's, you know, all over the world now. But I guess that's kind of mainly known in America more than anything. And uh, cigarette ads, they feature the most famous advertising figures and, you know, also some of the most controversial. And that's something that we're going to look at a bit later. Uh, like with, uh, uh, like especially like whenever we looked at uh, teen, like teen tobacco use. Uh, we're going to go into this in a little bit more detail. <clears throat> And, of course, if you're familiar, uh, you never you uh, hear tobacco advertising, you probably think of the Marlboro Man. You know, the Marlboro Man. He is actually, uh, in advertising age, they, uh, they named him uh, the most recognized character. A tough, strong, yet silent spokesman for cigarette smoking. He never talked. And the ad campaign started in the late 50s, originally showing a smoker in a variety of manly occupations, uh, such as a lifeguard, a pilot, even a military drill sergeant. But the, re the public responded best to the cowboy. And uh, before the manly makeover, Marlboro was considered a British import that was actually mostly purchased by women. The ad slogan in those early days was Marlboro, as mild as May, and print ads often feature talking babies, so that's something that really didn't, uh, you know, really wasn't appealing to men. But then Marlboro's image, though, got a complete facelift when the brand offered a filtered cigarette, capturing the interest and brand loyalty of many young people. And a whole new generation started smoking Marlboros, and many people still do, as that's still the most sold cigarette out there. In 1950, the most successful cigarette in the U.S. was actually Camel. Camel sold 98.2 billion packs a year. Marlboro at that time wasn't even in the top 10. By 1970, Marlboro ranked number three with sales of 51.37 billion packs. And then the brand rose to the very top in 1979. And even though the cigarette market was a little bit smaller, like in 1979, than it was in the 50s, you know, because of the, really, because of the 1960s, you know, whenever people really first started uh, exposing, like how smoking caused lung cancer and everything, the uh, industry dropped a lot. However, Marlboro, though, they still sold 103.6 billion packs in 1979. And the year 1979 also featured a strange contrast between image and reality at the stockholders meeting Philip Morris, the company behind the Marlboro brand. The actor model who actually portrayed the original Marlboro man, who was a smoker, also in real life, was actually dying of cancer, you know, because of that. And he actually asked the company to stop their aggressive advertising. And uh, the company refused. And uh, by 1992, Financial World, the business magazine, ranks Marlboro as the world's number one brand with a market worth of $32 billion. And a Camel Cigarettes, uh, they also have a place in advertising history. When launched in 1913, the brand revolutionized the flavor of cigarettes with a special American blend of tobacco. A series of innovative advertising campaigns turned Camel into the first nation, national brand. By 1919, 38% of all cigarettes made in the U.S. were actually Camels. Compared to the filter cigarettes of the 60s, however, Camels seemed rough, and so Camel smokers were older. And by 1979, Camel had fallen all the way down to number 7 in sales. And so the company's response, they developed an idea a filtered cigarette with a taste that would attract beginning smokers, i.e. young people. And getting the attention of this young market meant introducing a new advertising campaign. And so if you're familiar with the history, you know where we're going here. Camel ads began featuring Joe Camel, a cartoon figure who played a saxophone, wore sunglasses and a leather jacket, and generally enjoyed doing slightly rebellious things. And so who do you think that's targeting? Young people. And a Joe actually even offered tickets to rock concerts and also came up with something called Camel Cash that was very popular. And uh, 
Depending on the number of coupons that people collected, they could acquire a wide range of items bearing Joe's picture and the camel logo. Uh, anything from baseball hats, backpacks, jackets, and like I said, if you bought enough cigarettes, you could even get tickets to like music concerts. And so this obviously, you know, very much aimed at young people. When the campaign was launched in 1987, only 0.5, so that's only half of 1% of people under the age of 18 smoked camels. But by 1999, almost one-third of those age 18 had become camel smokers. And like I was just saying there, you know, many adults complained that this company was targeting children. A 1991 study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association supported that view. It showed that more than 90% of the six-year-olds survey could actually identify Joe Camel. You know, about the same percentage as young people who could recognize Mickey Mouse. In response to these cam complaints, this company said, this is what they said, they were not trying to get young people to smoke, but to ensure product identification among young people who were going to smoke anyway. So that's... Mm. I need to get that taste out of my mouth. You know, that's just outright ridiculous. You know, anybody with any sense, even a five-year-old, you know, would know that they're trying to, you know, trying to advertise to young people. And so now, uh, targeting new smokers, because that's what it's all about. So one might interpret the Joe Camel controversy. It shows that tobacco companies are targeting young people. Why? Because, you know, in plain business terms, you know, you really don't have to be a very intelligent person to know it. Tobacco companies always need new cu new customers because, you know, so many of their older customers die. You know, like the average, you know, the lifespan of a smoker, you know, is, uh, is much less than those who do smoke. And the American Lung Association estimates that one million new smokers a year must be recruited for the tobacco companies to maintain their profits. Say, so, you know, if you're... You know, if your previous generation dies and they quit, you know, you got to replace them. 30% of smokers began at age 18. And see, and even though now, even though, you know, like tobacco companies aren't able to do this type of thing, oh, uh, you know, to like advertise the way that they did many years ago, you know, you still see the effect of it. You know, it's young people, you know, who, who begin smoking. You know, 30% of smokers, you know, begin at age 18. You know, only 5% per percent of new recruits come into the habit at age 24. You know, and the percentages drop, you know, drastically after that. So, <clears throat> in addition to all that, smokers who start young, some start as young as like 12, 13, 14, they offer the most profit. And that's, you know, the average age for people, you know, who begin smoking, you know, like that age, they're like 13 you know, to like 22 years old, you know, that's when, you know, most people do begin smoking. You know, as we said there, like after age of 24, there's a very, very slim chance that a person begins using any type of tobacco after the age of 24. And see those who start young there, just to reiterate, those people who do start that very young, those young teenagers, you know, they are for the most profit because they spend many years smoking and, you know, they tend to be loyal to the brands that they begin with. You know, most people don't switch brands. You know, you get like a 13 or 14 year old, you know, to begin smoking camels or Marlboro, et cetera, or dipping, you know, Skull, Copenhagen, Chewing Levi Garrett or, you know, Red Man or Taylor's Pride. You know, most people never, uh, never quit. And, you know, that's still saw today by the continuing success, you know, of Marlboro and Camel. Because, you know, even people younger than, you know, a bit younger than I am, you know, like people who began smoking as teenagers, you know, back like in the, you know, like the 1990s, maybe even the late 80s, you know, if they're still living, you know, they still smoke, you know, Marlboro Camel or, you know, they dip Skull, Copenhagen, <clears throat> you know, etc. <coughs> and of course, some people are more difficult to persuade than others. Like in this day and time, like we actually looked at that a bit, uh, you know, last, uh, like the last lecture, maybe even the lecture before that, we mentioned some of that, uh, how some age groups have changed. Like, just generally speaking, most educated people no longer use tobacco products. Uh, like, particularly when you look at Caucasian males, because Caucasian males, they were the main tobacco users. Of course, not just with smoking, but also like with dipping and chewing, especially, 
you know, Caucasian males were the, you know, were the main people who did that, you know, from, you know, like the 1940s, you know, all the way through the 1980s. But then in the 1990s, you know, educated, educated people as a whole, you know, quit that stuff. And cigarette companies, you know, therefore, they've had to look to other groups to recruit new smokers. And a one target market has been females, you know, particularly more like middle class to, you know, blue collar working class ladies. And uh, since the 1920s, certain brands have targeted women. And like the 1960s, you know, saw uh, major new brands like Virginia Slims marketed to a new generation of women. And both of those eras also saw a substantial rise in the, num in the number of young women who smoked. Cigarette companies say that they simply cashed in on a growing trend. And in 1960, about 10% of cigarette ads appeared in women's magazines. But by 1985, advertising had increased to 34% in women's magazines. Then a magazines for people with more expensive taste, like GQ, you know, Gentleman's Quarterly, you know, they often have ads for cigars and then some of the higher, you know, higher in brand cigarettes. And a very different brands appear more in general interest magazines like Time or in secret supermarket tabloids. Edgy magazines like Maxim, you know, that are aimed at young males, you know, they had ads. I should say had. They're not allowed to do that anymore. I'm talking about during this time, like in the 90s, they had ads for, uh, like, smokeless tobacco, like, you know, Copenhagen, Skull, Levi Garrett, etc. Then a magazine like Lucky, you know, aimed at young women, you know, would advertise more women-type brands. Then magazines that are, that are more like Ebony, that are more so uh, marketed toward African Americans, they would have menthol cigarettes like uh, Newport and Cools. <clears throat> of course, these tobacco companies, they place their ads in there to, uh, to catch the eyes and the taste of potential smokers. Whose eyes might they be trying to catch? Several groups have a smaller percentage of smokers than average. By targeting them, tobacco companies can recruit new smokers from previously unexploited markets. Um, like, uh, like back in about the year 2000, 27% of Caucasian American males smoke, 23% of Caucasian American females smoke, 22% of African American women smoked versus 32% of African American men. And then in the Latino company, uh, the Latino community, 26% of men and only 14% of the women smoked. And then uh, percentage of smokers among among Asian ethnicities were even much smaller. And so how do the tobacco companies view the people they set out to recruit as smokers? Uh, like in the BBC TV documentary, documentary Tobacco Wars, a former tobacco spokesperson uh, turned anti-smoking a turned anti-smoking crusader related a chilling comment from a major executive. So this is a guy who used to uh, be a tobacco smokes person, but then he turned and became very anti-tobacco. <clears throat> he said, uh, many of the people running the company didn't smoke tobacco themselves or use it in any way. So a lot of these executive people, you know, they don't even use the product. As the executive put it, we just reserve the right to sell it to the young, the poor, the black, the stupid. And so obviously that just shows the changing trend there that educated people, uh, you know, don't, uh, you know, don't use tobacco products as much. They aim it toward young people, uh, like poor people and like, you know, urban neighborhoods, you know, that have more crime, etc. And like, you know, just the stupid, like, you know, people that are uneducated. And so that just shows the heart of these people. And we're going to look at some Bible verses here. Of course, we are faith-based about deception here. Just to get us some help from the Word of God. And also help those trying to quit. That's what this is all about. <clears throat> and so they claim here, tobacco companies claim, we really don't target young people. But as we've kind of said there, tobacco companies need young smokers, you know, young tobacco users to make up for older smokers who quit or pass away. See, the earlier a person starts tobacco, the more profit that it's going to give the tobacco companies. And as we were saying, they're back in youth-oriented magazines like Sports Illustrated. You find ads for tobacco. But you look at a magazine toward older, toward elderly people like the Ladies Home Journal, and you're more likely to find advertisements for products that help tobacco users quit, of course. This being back before it was 
before it was illegal to uh, for tobacco companies to advertise in places. But now, of course, they are altogether restricted. But now looking at some verses here about deception, because you can see here this is just filled, you know, filled with deception. First Peter chapter 2 and verse number 1 says, We're for laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. And uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 10. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. 2 Corinthians 11, 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the, into the apostles of Christ. See, these people here claim to be doing good and all, and giving people pleasure, but they are nothing but deceitful workers. Ephesians 5, 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. See, a person that uses tobacco has been deceived. They just were not as spiritual as they should have been. Jeremiah 9, 6. Vine habitation is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit they refuse to know me, saith the Lord. And also Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. See, everybody has a deceitful heart. Everybody is prone to deceit. That's why we must have a close walk with God. Psalm 5, 6. Quite a few here from the Psalms. Though thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing, the Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. <clears throat> Psalm 36, 3. The words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. He hath left off to be wise. And to do good. <clears throat> this here is talking about wicked people. See, wicked people are just full of iniquity and deceit. They are not wise. They don't do good. See, they're nothing but evil. In Psalm 101, 7. He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. <clears throat> See those that are just full of deceit. They cannot dwell in the presence of God. Now here's some good verses for people who, uh, to help people quit. Particularly, of course, all of this will be that way. But this would be more so a verse for a person to claim that has quit. Like, if you're struggling with this addiction, if that's, you know, really anything ungodly, tobacco, alcohol, pornography, gambling, or whatever, use these verses here. Psalm 43, 1. Judge me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. So pray to be delivered from these people. To have a pure heart and a pure mind. 1 Peter chapter 2, last one here in verse 22. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. See there, guile, that's another term for deceit. <clears throat> See that there, that's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He did no deceit. He did no sin, and he's the one that we must turn to, amen, to help us with all addictions. <clears throat> So now we're going to be looking at the ban. Just going to look over this here. Then we will uh, close to being through. But the ban that has been done, though, on tobacco. 
Before 1964, people smoked in offices, theaters, and even in airplanes. You know, there were no restrictions. Nearly one half of all adult Americans enjoyed smoking. You know, can you imagine an interviewer smoking a cigarette as he speaks with the world's newsmakers on television? One of TV's most respected newsmen did exactly that on a major interview show during the 1950s. Every channel ran advertisements for dozens of brand of cigarettes. Cigarette slogans and jingles were a major part of pop culture. But then, in 1964, as we've mentioned here, uh, whenever a Surgeon General Luther Terry issued the report linking cigarette smoking with cancer, it, uh, it resulted in a law requiring a warning on every pack of cigarettes. And we're actually going to go look over that. I actually just read that in the book that I showed you today, Merchants of Death. Uh, <clears throat> in initially, this was supposed to be a much more stern warning, like cigarette smoking can cause death. But they watered it down, though, to just say cigarette smoking may be hazardous to your health. That's all it said, you know, when it was supposed to say, uh, you know, cigarette smoking can lead to death. <laughs> A second report followed in 1967. And that year, the Federal Communications Commission, the government agency overseeing broadcasting in the U.S., decided to apply the fairness doctrine to cigarette advertising. The rule had originally been drafted to ensure that both sides of political questions would be covered. However, several activists convinced the regulators that television stations should offer time for anti-smoking commercials, as well as for cigarette ads. By 1969, Congress was considering the idea of banning all cigarette commercials from TV and radio. Of the major networks of that day, only CBS volunteered to refuse tobacco ads. NBC and ABC rejected the notion. In 1970, Congress passed the legislation, and the ban went into effect in 1971. The law also called for a stronger label on every pack of cigarettes that said, warning, the Surgeon General has determined that cigarette smoking is dangerous to your health. So they did up it up there a notch. So on January 2nd, 1971, cigarette ads disappeared from the airwaves, but also did the anti-smoking messages required under the Fairness Doctrine. <clears throat> and see, really, though, to no surprise... The year after the anti-tobacco ads stopped, consumption of cigarettes rose. Which is also why back in, uh, like in the 1980s, you know, tobacco went back up again. Their sales went way up. <clears throat> so in the response by the tobacco industries, although stations could no longer broadcast advertisements, cigarette brand names and logos continue to appear on television. Hmm, how? As early as 1968, tobacco companies were sponsoring race cars. Like in the 1970s, they started sponsoring entire sporting events like Winston Cup. You know, something I'm very familiar with. You know, the NASCAR racing. Like I'm from upstate South Carolina originally. That was very, very big. <laughs> uh, like Winston Cup, you know, that began in 1975. And then like the Virginia Slims Tennis Tournament, you know, that was also very popular there. Uh, you know, targeted at women. That began in 1971. In a recent Marlboro racing event, well, I say recent, this would have been back in about the year 2000, in a, a Marlboro racing event, the Marlboro name appeared almost 6,000 times in 90 minutes. So, you know, that's a lot there. But in 1995, the Justice Department, though, closed another loophole that allowed tobacco companies to receive airtime. Marlboro was forced to take down a number of billboards and sporting arenas. The huge signs had been placed where TV cameras were most likely to be focused, such as over the players' entrances to the arena or behind the goalpost, etc. Then a fact sheet issued in 2003 by the American Lung Association pointed out that if you compare advertising and promotion budgets from before the ban on broadcast advertising in the present, you'd actually find that tobacco companies... Back in 2003, they were spending 23 times more than what they did in 1971. So it just rose, you know, with sponsoring NASCAR and tennis tournaments, you know, ball games and all that stuff. <clears throat> then in 2000, tobacco companies spent $9.6 billion on advertising and promotion. This amount includes the cost for sponsoring sporting events like the Winston Cup and cultural affairs like dance performances at New York's Lincoln Center. Advertising money exerts considerable influence on newspapers and magazines. In 1978, for instance, the Columbia Journalism Review examined how various publications were covering the health aspects of smoking 
in the seven years since the TV advertising ban. Although political health and legal experts continue to challenge tobacco company claims that the dangers of smoking were not proven, not a single in-depth article appeared. Newspapers and magazines seemed unwilling to offend major advertisers. Uh, like when Mother Jones actually did a cover story on smoking in 1979 that a magazine pointed toward elderly ladies. The uh, magazine informed tobacco advertisers about the planned story as a courtesy, you know, saying, hey, you know, we're going to be doing a, uh, we're going to be doing a cover story here about how bad tobacco is for your health. You know, they were telling them that reasoning that they might want to withdraw their advertising for that issue. <clears throat> And in fact, the major uh, cigarette companies withdrew their advertising from that magazine for several years. <clears throat> Let's see here. Tobacco companies, though, have used advertising to promote their products and silence criticism. Although no magazine seemed like, um, and I'm not sure if we, I don't think we've gone over this in any lectures, but I get in, we're going to get into this a little bit later. And although no magazines have been punished as bad as Mother Jones, major broadcasting networks like ABC and CBC have been threatened with expensive lawsuits when their newscasters prepared exposés on the tobacco industry. Like that's something that's also mentioned, you know, like in that book, Merchants of Death, in pretty good detail. See, and the companies, you know, that make up big tobacco, these big six tobacco companies, they won't hesitate to use financial and legal leverage to avoid damaging news stories. Now, I guess something else that we're going to look at when we get into, uh, like, teen smoking, kind of some things, more more, uh, more so pointed toward teenagers uh, here in a, uh, maybe here in a few lectures or so. <clears throat> See, whenever these, uh, whenever other like magazines, you know, or whatever, like even a TV TV networks, you know, are going are going to have some type of, <clears throat> uh, you know, documentary, you know, about how bad tobacco is for your health and how you know deceptive these companies have been, you know, these tobacco companies, you know, they get their lawyers and say, hey, you know, you release this, we're gonna sue you, and you know, we're gonna win, we're not gonna allow you to show this, and so just more deception. Well, that these uh, that these tobacco companies have done. So thank you for being there with us uh, today. Actually, in our next lecture, uh, we're going to look at uh, alcohol and tobacco use, how they are both uh, how they both go together. And so look forward to that the next time we do meet. Thank you so much for being with us and uh, viewing the lecture. And, and we'll see you next time. Until the direction of the shuttles flee away. I am Brother Coop, and I love you and I appreciate you.